Good morning, Emmaus Church. How's everybody doing? Man, it's good to see everybody. You guys look great. Uh, so here's the thing. Um, a little bit of context if you're new here. Uh, here at Emmaus Church, we, we, are, uh, we primarily uh, preach uh, chapter by chapter, verse by verse through books of the Bible, which means uh, today we find ourselves, uh, because we've been in a series through the book of Genesis for over a year now, uh, we find ourselves in Genesis chapter 38, okay? So I don't know if you read ahead, but I'm just going to go ahead and say it. First of all, if you're new here today, this is your first time with us, welcome to church. We don't, we, don't preach like, we don't preach things like this every week, but we do preach them when they're in the Bible, and that's where we're at, okay? So we didn't kind of cherry pick something to talk about uh, today. I do want to, sort of a public service announcement, say this, and I mean this. I said this first service too. Um, you know, we, we as a church, we've never been a church where, uh, you know, we, we kind of stop people at the door and say, hey, time out. You, you can't bring your kid in here because your kid is only uh, so-and-so age old. We, we, we've never said that. And we won't. We love the idea of, of parents worshiping alongside their kids and think it's biblical. Yet we also every week provide uh, gospel-centered uh, child classes for your kids to uh, learn Bible stories, engage in worship, and be taught by our incredible uh, kids ministry volunteers. And we do that every week. Um, and so we don't stop anybody and tell, say kids can't come in here. But I'm going to go ahead and tell you this right now, right out of the gate. Um, like... Again, I don't know if you read ahead or not, or maybe it's your first time here. I'm just going to tell you, uh, like this stuff, we're just dealing with the text today, but, but we're dealing with a text that is uh, sort, of, sort of heavy. And so um, if you feel like the Holy Spirit might be leading you to check your kid in to kids ministry now, don't feel, you know, out of the ordinary getting up and going to do that. Now, you don't have to. Use your discretion on that. Um, that's totally up to you. But I just want to say that out of the gate. Fair? All right, so let's do this, man. Let's not prolong it. Let's just uh, do it. Here's the deal. Uh, God, the Lord tells us in the New Testament, all Scripture is God-breathed and useful. Agreed? All of it. All Scripture. All of it. The whole Bible. And so God has something to say to us through uh, this story as insane as it is. Um, so I'm going to pray. I need to pray. We need extra prayer today, and then we're going to dive in. And Father, would we be a people who humble ourselves before you? Would our hearts be open to what it is you want to say to us through your word? Believe this is your word. Trust that this is your word. I pray for every single person in here, from the people who have been at Emmaus for years, and uh, Lord, this is their church, this is their family, and they serve, and they're invested, and they, 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 people who just, they love you, and they're here, all the way to the people who this is their first time here. I pray for everybody, you know every heart, you know every need, and you know how to apply this word to the hearts of your people. I pray right now that you speak through me, not with wise or persuasive words, but with a demonstration of your Holy Spirit's power, that the faith of the people of Emmaus Church might not rest on some man's wisdom, but on God's power. Amen. You speak right now to us, or would we be listening? I pray it all through Christ, amen. Amen. All right, so, so Genesis 38, right? That's where we are. And, and I'm going to start with this, um, kind of get a run and start. As, as many of you know, uh, last, last week uh, here at Emmaus Church, we had a couple visitors, right? So, so for some reason, uh, two huge Canadian geese were flying over the church parking lot and apparently looked down and thought to themselves, wow, that looks like an incredible place to lay eggs and attack human beings, right? So... And that's what they did, right? I mean, they, they, they set up shop in our parking lot. They, they landed at one point, and they're, they were here for like a week, right? And just, just kind of making, making it their home. And, and I got to be honest with you, like at first, when, when I first saw them, and we were up here one day, and it was me and uh, Pastor Jeremy and Pastor Travis, and we were all up here, and we saw these geese. And at first, we were like, well, isn't that cute? That's cute, right? It's just geese, and they're being cute geese. They're out there waddling, doing what geese do, and not, you know, not bothering anybody, and just kind of doing that thing. And so, so at first, we thought they were cute, but then Sunday came, okay? Sunday morning came, and here's how it went down. So last Sunday morning, uh, I, I got here, and I was the first one here. It's probably about, you know, 6 o'clock in the morning. The sun's, still not, the sun's not even up yet. And, and so I roll in the parking lot, and as I'm rolling down this hill right here, I noticed that, that one of these geese is standing in the middle of the parking lot, like in the middle of the, the lane where I would drive. He's just, he's just standing there, and he's staring at me as my car comes down. I'm like, well, that's odd, right? So I decide, well, you know what? It's, 
yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to drive my car, and he's got to get out of the way, right? Because it's survival of the fittest, right? And I'm a human. So um, I, I just decided, I'm a, what? I, I, you know, I'm, this guy's in the way. So I roll up, and y'all, I'm inching closer to him, and I notice Brother Man's not moving. Like, he's not budging. He's just standing there. He's almost daring me, hit me, right? I mean, he's, like, he's like, giving me this look. Like, this is my world. Why are you here, right? And he's looking at my car, and, and so finally I, I swerved, and I'm thinking to myself, this, this is crazy, right? I mean, I, like I literally just lost a game of chicken to a Canadian goose. This is insane, right? And so I'm like, what, what in the world is going on? So, so what I didn't know, here's the deal. What I didn't know at the time is uh, the reason he wasn't budging and the reason he was, he was so, like, intense on staying where he was is because just a couple feet away over here in this little pine straw island in the parking lot, a couple feet away, his girl had laid a few eggs, and she was sitting on the eggs in the pine straw island while he's, he's keeping guard, right? He's standing watch, and, and he's, he's kind of aggressive because he's guarding these eggs. Now, I didn't know that at the time, uh, but that's when it got really interesting because because at that point, uh, Pastor Jeremy arrives at the church, right? And, uh, and Pastor Jeremy, our worship pastor, he's not here today, got the weekend off, but Pastor Jeremy shows up and, and he, he just, Jeremy decides, he sees this, these geese and he's like, well, I gotta do something about it. If y'all know Jeremy, y'all know Jeremy. Jeremy's an outdoorsy guy, right? And he kind of likes trees and caves and stuff. I don't know, I don't get it. Um, but anyway, <laughs> I don't know why I said that. So, so he he decides, and he's not really afraid of animals, so he's like, you know, he shoots them and stuff. So he's like, uh, he sees these geese, and he, he decides, well, we got to do something about these geese, because people are going to be arriving here for church, and we can't just have geese standing in the middle of the parking lot, right? We got to do something. So Jeremy comes up with this plan, and here's Pastor Jeremy's plan. Pastor Jeremy's like, um, uh, here's what I'm going to do. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run at him as fast as I can, and he'll fly away. I'm going to sprint. And I'm like, okay, that sounds good. Just let me get my camera ready. <laughs> all right. It's just like, that's what I'm going to run at him. That's what I'm playing. I'm going to run at him, and I'm going to scare him. So all of a sudden, uh, he gets ready, and the goose is standing there, and he starts running as fast as he can, y'all, and he's sprinting at this goose. And at that point, like, I'm watching this thing go down because I see Pastor Jeremy's running as fast as he can towards the goose, but the interesting part was the goose wasn't moving. Like, the goose is just standing there. He looks quite amused, and he's staring at Pastor Jeremy as he runs towards him, and he's thinking to himself, you about to die, right? <laughs> And so Pastor Jeremy, running up to him, he gets like five feet away from the goose, y'all. And the true story, there were witnesses here that saw this thing go, go down. He gets like five feet away from this goose, and all of a sudden the goose raises up, man, like Karate Kid, right? <laughs> Wings go out. I'm not even kidding. His head goes up, tongue comes out, and then he begins to fly straight towards Pastor Jeremy's face. <laughs> it was awesome. And y'all, I'm telling you, like I have never, I have never in my life seen a man change the direction he was running in so fast. It was, it was amazing. Like, like literally, like one second he is sprinting north, and the next second he's sprinting south and screaming. <laughs> and I'm, I'm just going to tell you, like there are few things funnier in this world than watching Jeremy run away from a goose. It's quite fantastic. Now, um... Here's why I tell you that story. And don't tell him I said that. He's not here today. Don't tell him I said that. Um, here's, here's the point I want to make. Some things are worth running away from. Right? So, so like, for example, um, a crazy Canadian goose, that's worth running away from. Right? Uh, a, a fire that's out of control, that's worth running away from. And, uh, and just so you're aware, something like sin is worth running away from. And so today, we, we find ourselves in Genesis chapter 38, and I'm going to be honest with you, man. Um, just for entertainment's sake, did anybody read ahead? Anybody read this chapter in the past few days? Okay, so um, I, I just go ahead and right out of the gate, just again tell you, this chapter is very awkward. This chapter is sort of disturbing. And I'm just going to go ahead and be honest, it's weird to preach to a group of people staring at you. Okay, it's weird. Um, but, but just so you know, th there is actually an extremely powerful point that the Lord is trying to make to every single one of us through this chapter of the Bible Church family. And the point that God is trying to get across to each one of us this morning through Genesis 38 is this right here. In the same way that if you play with fire, 
you will get burned. If you play with sin, you will get hurt. Let's go ahead and lay the framework right there, the groundwork, and let's just go ahead and establish that, okay? In the same way that if you play with fire, you will get burned. If you play with something like sin, you will inevitably get hurt. So, so let me show you what I'm talking about, man. Genesis 38, and again, picking it up in verse 1, we ended the end of chapter 37 last week. And, and before we dive in gen, to, to, to Genesis 38, here's what you need to know. When we get to Genesis 38, again, we've been, in this, we've been in this Genesis series for well over a year now, this going verse by verse, chapter by chapter, and, and when we get to Genesis 38, here's what's happening in the Genesis narrative. We've been primarily focused on this guy named Jacob, been following his story, right? And then in Genesis 37, we got to 37, and what we saw is this, what we saw that Jacob now has 12 sons, and his favorite son, out of all 12, his favorite son is a guy named Joseph. Okay? But, but Joseph, jo- or Jacob's other sons, don't like Joseph, and they don't like the fact that he's their daddy's favorite son. So what they ended up doing is they ended up betraying Joseph. They ended up selling Joseph into slavery, and then they ended up going back home and telling their daddy that Joseph died out in the fields when he was attacked by a wild animal. In other words, what we've already established about Jacob's family is this. They've got some issues, Amen. They got issues, they got baggage, they're total wreck, they're absolute train wreck, they're completely jacked, right? That's, that's this family. And now things get interesting, man, because as we, as we dig into Genesis 38, we're, we're about to focus in on, on one of Jacob's other sons named Judah. Judah. Count of three, everybody say Judah. Ready? One, two, three. Judah. And, and out of curiosity, let me ask you this, show of hands, how many of you have ever heard of Judah. You ever heard of Judah? Yeah, some of you heard of Judah. Now, now here, let me ask you this question. Um, so, so for those of you who have heard of Judah uh, in the Bible, let me ask you this: when, when you hear the name Judah, what comes to mind? Anybody? Lion, lion. That's for me too, right? Lion, lion, lion of Judah, right? Lion of tribe of Judah. And now, now here's the thing: like, like if you're like me, then you're kind of thinking to yourself, "Wow, if Judah is associated with a lion." must be a pretty cool cat, right? Might be a pretty cool guy. Well, let's read. Let's see. God help us. Here we go. Genesis 38, verse 1. It happened at that time. What time is that? It's the time. Remember what just happened? They just betrayed Joseph. They just sold Joseph into slavery, into Egypt, right? It happened at that time that Judah went down from his brothers and turned aside to a certain Adulamite whose name was Hera. All right, so let's pause there for a second. But you, you got to get this, man. This is really important, really important. Because, because here's the deal. Right out of the gate, here's what we just saw, Emmaus. We, we got Judah, Jacob's son, who belongs to a Christian family. We'll call them a Christian family. I mean, yes, they got their issues, their baggage, their stuff, but like at the end of the day, they are a family who worships the Lord. They're a family who God Almighty has given his promises to, right? So we got Judah, who's a part of this family, but what we just got told in verse one is that here's Judah deciding to, to leave his family. He decides to leave God's people, and now he decides to, you know, basically, he, he, he goes away and he goes to kick it with a bunch of unbelievers. That's what he just did, right? He, he, just, he just left the Christian crew, or the, 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 the God-fearing crew and the, and the worshipers of the Lord, he just left them, and he's like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, enough with them, I'm going to go over here to these, to these unbelievers, I'm going I'm to go hang out with them, I'm going to go live with them. In other words, right, right out of the gate, what, what, we, what we see about this brother Judah is, is that he's surrounding himself with the wrong people. A church family, follow this, because Proverbs 13, 20 says this, he who walks with the wise grows wise, but a companion of fools will suffer harm. And just so you're aware, what that means is this. The kind of people that you decide to surround yourself with matters a whole lot. So, so, so like, don't, don't gloss over verse one here, man. Don't miss this, because this is absolutely significant, Emmaus Church, because just so you know, our boy Judah is about to walk through some extremely intense pain here in Genesis 38, and it is no accident that the very first thing we're told right here in this chapter about Judah is that it all started when Judah decided to surround himself with a bunch of fools who hated God. 
That's where it went sideways. That's where it started to go downhill. He intentionally surrounds himself with a bunch of people who don't care about God, don't love God, don't follow God, don't worship God, and, and it starts to go awry, as you'll see. Watch this. Uh, he does something else foolish in verse 2. Check this out. There Judah saw the daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua. He took her and went into her. All right, so it's a question for you, may I say, audience participation here. Um, may I ask you a question? Is, is this lady that Judah just hooked up with, is she a worshiper of God? Anybody? What's your answer? No? No? How do we know that? She's a Canaanite. She, look at y'all. Look at y'all. Been in Genesis for over a year. Exegeting the Bible. That's what I'm talking about, man. That's beautiful. Beautiful. So in other words, so, so it's huge to point out. Follow this. We just got told something really significant. It, Judah just decided to blatantly disobey God. He takes an unbeliever as his wife all because she's good looking. That's what just happened. That's what just happened, man. I mean, he sees a good looking lady. It's lust at first sight. And he says, you're mine. Yokes himself together with her, marries her. So that's, that's, that's your lion Judah guy, right? Okay, that's him. Okay, so, so watch this. Verse three, watch this. And she conceived and bore a son and he called his name Ur. She conceived again and bore a son, and she called his name Onan. Yet again, she bore a son, and she called his name Sheila. <laughs> Poor guy. <laughs> you imagine? I'm serious. Do you imagine? You're a dude walking around, your name Sheila. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Now watch this. Judah was in Kazib when she bore him. So, 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 so watch this. Here's where we're at at the end of verse five, church family. Here's where we're at. We get to the end of verse five and what we see is Judah has married this lady who doesn't give a rip about God. They start making babies. They've had three sons, right? It's my three sons. These sons start to get older, start to grow up as sons often do, right? So, so watch what happens now in, in verse six. Watch this. And Judah took a wife for Ur, his firstborn, and her name was Tamar. But Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord put him to death. Wow. Did you catch that? Right, so, so, so follow what the text just said to us, church family. We, 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 just, we just literally got told from the Bible there was this brother named Ur. He was wicked in the sight of the Lord, so God killed him. Did, did you get that? God killed him. Like, like, we're not told what he did. Apparently, we're, we're not supposed to know that. We, we don't need to know that. Well, we're not told what his particular sin was. We're not told what made him so wicked in the sight of the Lord. All we're told is that one day, God said, you know what, man? I'm tired of you, and I'm tired of your sin, so guess what? You're dead. So, so I'm reading this this week, and I'm thinking to myself, here, here's the question that, that that I jump to. When I read something like that, immediately this week, I'm reading that and I'm thinking to myself, man, it caused me to ask this question. How, okay, so, so like if that happened, how come God doesn't kill all evil people? Right? I mean, why, why doesn't God kill every wicked person? I mean, I mean, how, why is it that God just doesn't do this immediately to every evil person in the world? Because obviously he doesn't because we're all still sitting here breathing, Right? So obviously God doesn't deal with everybody like this. So, so why is it that God doesn't just like take every evil person, meaning all of us, and immediately just, just kill us immediately? Why didn't God do that? Okay, well, here's the answer, Maeus. Here's the answer. It's because God is, uh, quite frankly, really gracious. He's really gracious. Which begs another question. Because you go, okay, well, all right, well, then if God's gracious... Why does he kill this guy? If God's gracious, then why did he kill this guy? And then why did he go to the extent of actually not only killing the brother, but like putting it in Genesis 38 so that all of us would have to read it? Like why, why does God kill this guy and then make sure we all know he killed this guy? Why does God do that? Well, here's what I think. I'll tell you what I think. Here's what I think, your family. I, th I think that it's because God wants us all to understand this. Yes, he's gracious, but just so you know, he can still kill you. 
I mean, church family, the point is this. God actually wants to be taken seriously. Like he does. Our God doesn't enjoy being mocked. God isn't real interested in playing a whole bunch of games with us. Our God is a holy God. He really does hate sin. And if we choose to make a mockery out of him, and if we choose to play him for a fool, there will be consequences. And quite frankly, sometimes those consequences are your heart blows up and nobody knows why. Some of y'all look at me like, whoa. I know. I, I, real, I realize this is not an effective church growth strategy talking about this right now. I realize. I, I realize I, you think I don't know that? <laughs> but like, here's the deal. Like, if we're going to preach Bible, let's preach Bible. Let's preach Bible if we're going to do it. And <sighs> some of y'all are concerned. You hear that and you go, well, that's a, that's a bit far. God killing people, man. I mean, I... <laughs> I know we've been in Genesis for a long time, but you've been reading too much Old Testament, right? I mean, you've you got to get to the New Testament, get to, get to grace. We've got grace in Jesus, and God kind of changes, right? He's, he's, a, he's a kinder, gentler God in the New Testament, right? And he's, he's sort of different, and he's nice. He's, he's sweet in the New Testament, right? Like a big, giant care bear, right? Giving out lollipops and hugs, right? We just, God's changed the New Testament. All right. Let's go with that. Let's go with that. I'm, I'm going to read you something from the New Testament, okay? And keep in mind that what I'm about to read you, this happens after Jesus Christ has come to the earth and lived the perfect life on our behalf. This happens after Jesus Christ has died for our sins. This happens after Jesus Christ has risen again. This happens after the Holy Spirit of God has come to dwell within believers. And here's what happens. Acts chapter 5, verse 1. But a man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property and with his wife's knowledge he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you've contrived this deed in your heart? You've not lied to man, but to God. Now, now let me clarify, man. Let me, let me just make sure we understand. Ananias and Sapphira didn't get in trouble because they weren't tithing. Ananias and Sapphira were in trouble because they had committed to give a certain portion to the work of the Lord. And they said, we're going to sell this land and we're going to give X amount of dollars to selling this land. And they made sure everybody knew about it. And then they sold the land. And instead of giving what they said they were going to give, they kept back some of it and only gave a portion of it, which means they wanted everybody around them to think they were generous when in fact they were greedy. That was their sin. That was their issue. That was where they fumbled. And then it says this, when Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last and great fear came upon all who heard of it. God killed him. The young men rose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. After an interval of about three hours, his wife came in not knowing what had happened. She didn't know she was a widow. She didn't even know yet. And Peter said to her, tell me, Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, yes, for so much. And Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out. Immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. When the young men came in, they found her dead and they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear, watch this, and great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard these things. In other words, you got two people, God kills, and as a result, people start getting saved. Because they're all looking at it going, God must be real. He just killed them. This thing must be legit. This thing must be, must be for real. And so all these people start getting saved. Now, now here's the point. Listen, church family, here's the point. Here we have Old Testament and New Testament examples of people who decided to do their own thing, make a mockery out of God, play God for a fool, and God then responds by saying, okay, you know what? You're dead. And watch this, man, because the powerful point that, that God is trying to communicate to every single one of us through these stories right here is this, church family. Here, here, what, what God is saying is this. God, God's saying, look, don't play me like I'm not real. Don't 
play these games like I'm not real. Don't say I'm real and then live like I'm not real. Like, don't live in such a way that you mock me. That's the point, man. That's, God's saying, look, I'm a real God and I am a gracious God, but like, you need to take me seriously. I'm your creator and you're the creation. And if I wanted to, I could take you out immediately. So you need to kind of remember that. And here's the thing. Let's just call it what it is. Some of us in here today are uh, living in such a way where we're not taking God seriously. I don't know what it is. I mean, a million different ways, right? We do this a million different ways. You're shady in your business practices. You got another lady on the side. You're lying to make yourself look good in the eyes of everybody else. You're just lying. You, you want everybody to think you're unbelievably generous, but, but in reality, greed has reached epic proportions in your life. And, and, and just your word, church family, listen, God has been extremely gracious and patient with you thus far up to this point. But like, make no mistake about it, man. He is calling you to repent and he is calling you to stop mocking him. Watch this. Romans 2 4 says this. Romans 2 4 says this. Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? In other words, what he's saying here is this hey, be careful now. Don't confuse God's patience for weakness. He's patient, but he's not weak. He won't be mocked, so, so, so God kills this brother Ur because of his wickedness. That's all we're told, because he was wicked. And then we read this, verse 8. Then Judah said to Onan, go into your brother's wife and perform the duty of a brother-in-law to her and raise up offspring for your brother. All right, so you need some context here. You need to understand something. So, so like 4,000 years ago, the tradition in this day was, was this. Um, if a man died and left his wife a widow and she didn't have children and that man had a brother, that, then, then according to tradition, it was now that brother's responsibility to marry that lady and to provide her with kids. Provide heir for the family, right? That, that was now her responsibility. So here we got Judah and Judah comes to own and his second born son and he says, listen brother, next man up. You got responsibility now. Your older brother's dead. His wife's a widow. Go marry Tamar. Go, go have some kids. So that's what's happening. And then verse 9. But Onan knew that the offspring would not be his. So whenever he went into his brother's wife, he would waste the semen on the ground so as not to give offspring to his brother. And what he did was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and he put him to death also, and the point is this, God kills another sinner who tries to play him off like a fool. You starting to see a pattern develop? And just so you know, okay, as weird and awkward and uncomfortable as this passage of scripture is right here, I'm just gonna tell you, man, this passage of scripture underneath the surface is actually extremely relevant for our 2015 suburban Atlanta culture. It like really is. This is relevant, man, because, because here's the deal. Here's what you got to understand. The sin, follow this, the sin that God just put on into death for here in Genesis 38 is this. Here's the sin. Onan was okay with having sex. He's okay with that. But he knew that if he had a son, that that son would now be the heir of the family and it wouldn't be Onan. Onan knew that. So as a result, Onan decided to ignore his responsibility and he decided to do something really, really, really foolish. In other words, think about it this way. Onan wanted, Onan wanted sexual pleasure. He just didn't want responsibility. Onan wanted to have fun. He just didn't want to take care of babies. Does this sound familiar to anybody in here? 
What? I mean, here's the deal, y'all. I don't know if you've noticed or not. I don't know if you've been looking around, but, but here's the reality, man. We, we live in a culture today where, where sexual pleasure, apart from responsibility, has basically become the norm. Have you noticed that? Matter of fact, we even go so far as to say this, man. We, we kind of live in a culture where if you don't pursue sexual pleasure apart from responsibility, people think you're weird. Do you know this? Do you, do you know this? Do you know the National Review recently reported that almost half of all the babies born in the United States of America today are born out of wedlock? Do you know that? Which means, here's what that means about our culture. Here's what that means. We've we got a bunch of guys running around our culture who want to have sex. They just don't want to be married. That's what that means. My, my own father, my own biological father, check this out. My own biological father stayed around, uh, you know, a few years long enough to get my mom pregnant a couple times. And then he ended up leaving, leaving me, my sister, my mom. Why? Because he wanted pleasure. He just didn't want responsibility. Listen, man, church family, listen, the entire reason that the pornography industry exists today is because people want pleasure apart from responsibility. That, that's the whole point. Do you know this, man? Do you know the United States produces 89% of the pornographic web pages in the world? Do you know that? Get this number, man. 244,661,900 web pages are pornographic web pages in our country alone. In our country alone. And here's why that number is so crazy, man. We only got 300 million people, y'all. The pornography industry makes $97 billion annually. $97 billion with a B. Every year. Check this out, man. The, the, the pornography industry, guess what? It alone makes more money than CBS, ABC, and NBC combined. You know why? You know why? Here's why. Because collectively we exist in a culture where um, we, we seek pleasure apart from responsibility. And church family, listen to me. Get, get this, man. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. Onan learned a very painful lesson right here in Genesis chapter 38, and it was this. Whenever we pursue pleasure apart from responsibility, there will always be consequences. Always. My, my wife and I recently purchased a, uh, a, a lighting fixture, a new lighting fixture for our home, and it was like go in the dining room type light, lighting fixture. And uh, so we were out there, and uh, we, we picked one out and thought it looked nice, and uh, we got it home, and it's in a box, right? It's totally disassembled. I mean, you have to put it together, right? And so uh, it looks good in the store. They got it all put together, and you're like, oh, that looks great. And then they hand you the box with a thousand different pieces, and you're like, this is not cool, right? And so we take it home, and it stayed in the box for about three weeks. And then there was this one day when my wife, Heather, is uh, getting ready to go run some errands, go out, you know, grocery shopping, stuff like that. And so uh, kids were in school, and so I decided, it's my opportunity, I'm gonna put this thing together. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you know, nobody else in the house. I'm gonna put this thing, I'm gonna hang it up and we're gonna have the lighting fixture installed. And so um, I got the box out and it was all by myself, turned off the electricity because apparently that's important, right? And so I get that, you know, I had that done. And then uh, I did, I proceeded to do what many of you men, maybe even all of you men have done at some point before. Here's how I put it together. I, I took it, I took the box, I took out every single one of the pieces. And I surveyed it like a man does, and then I got the instructions, I took one look at them, all I needed was a picture, I didn't need to read anything, that's how it's supposed to look, and then I threw them over my shoulder, and I proceeded to put the thing together, because my whole philosophy is this, it's the Imago Dei, it's theological, if I was created in the image of God, I ought to be able to put this thing together, <laughs> I mean, hello, like if I can't do that, I got issues, so I get, you know, I got the drill, I got the little, you know, Phillips head. That's the one tool I own, Phillips head, right? And so uh, I, I get that thing, and, and I'm putting the thing together, and I was feeling good about myself. Like, like I, it took a couple hours, seriously. It took a long time, but I finally get the thing together, I, even putting the fine, fine-tuning it, man, putting the bulbs in, running the chain through, clipping the chain to the appropriate length, the wires are pulled through. I, I get up on the ladder, I hook, I hook the thing up, I drill it in, the thing's hanging there, and I'm feeling good. But then I notice something's missing. It's the, it's the part that um, hides the hole with the wires in it. It's totally missing. It's, just got the, it's got the lighting fixture with a big hole with a bunch of wires. 
which like, let's be honest, like if I was a bachelor, that'd be no big deal, right? It'd be like, whatever, right? You wouldn't even care. But like I'm married and she's gonna notice stuff like that. So I'm like, man, you gotta be kidding me. So now like, now I gotta climb up this ladder. I gotta take the entire thing down. I gotta get it back down to the ground. And then here's what I, when I finally started to read the instructions, what I found out was this piece doesn't go on at the end. This piece goes on at the beginning. So I have to disassemble the entire lighting fixture now put it back together after I put the right part on, all because I didn't read the instructions. And I don't know if you've ever had this moment. It was one of those moments for me where where I could almost almost audibly hear the voice of the Holy Spirit saying, you're a moron. You know what I'm saying? Here's the point. Here's the point. Instructions are meant to help us. Amen? Instructions are meant to help us. And listen, church family, when we ignore them, it will ultimately go badly for us. And this is what happens to Onan. Onan ignores what God wants. He seeks pleasure apart from responsibility, and God kills him. So, for those of you who are keeping count, that's, that's now two sons of Judah that God has killed. Which brings us to verse 11. Watch this. Then Judah said to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, remain a widow in your father's house till Shelah, my son, grows up. Watch this. For he feared that he would die like his brothers. So Tamar went and remained in her father's house. All right, so, so in, other words, in other words, Judah doesn't realize that his two sons are dead because God killed them. He didn't realize that. Instead, he thinks his two sons are dead because Tamar's really bad luck. That's what he thinks. And he's like, man, I got, I got one more son. I got this final son, and if I marry him off to her, what if he dies too? So, so, we, so what does he do? He, according to the text, he, he goes to Tamar and says, Tamar, listen, here's the deal. Go, st- go stay at your dad's place. Let my son get a little bit older, and then I'll give my son to you. But then years pass by, okay? And Tamar begins to realize that Judah has lied to her. Judah's deceived her, right? And she's, she's becoming really desperate because she's not getting any younger and she still doesn't have any babies. And, and desperate people tend to do very desperate things, right? And that's what we begin to see here in verse 12. Watch this. Verse 12. In the course of time, the wife of Judah, she was daughter, died. When Judah was comforted, he went up to Timnah to his sheep shearers, he and his friend Hira the Adulamite. And when Tamar was told, your father-in-law is going up to Timnah to shear his sheep, she took off her widow's garments and covered herself with a veil, wrapping herself up and sat at the entrance to an aim, which is on the road to Timnah. For she saw that Sheila was grown up and she had not been given to him in marriage. When Judah saw her, he thought she was a prostitute for she had covered her face. He turned to her at the roadside and said, come, let me come in to you, for he did not know that she was his daughter-in-law. She said, what will you give me that you may come in to me? He answered, I will send you a goat, a young goat from the flock. And she said, if you give me a pledge until you send it. He said, what pledge shall I give you? She replied, your signet and your cord and your staff that is in your hand. So, she gave, so he gave them to her and went into her and she conceived by him. And then she arose and went away and taking off her veil, she put on the garments of her widowhood. All right. So frustrating. So frustrating. First of all, I want to talk to you about a couple of things. Okay, first of all, Notice, don't, don't miss this, man. Notice that Judah is a man who honestly is totally controlled by his lust. Don't, don't miss this point of the story. That this brother Judah is absolutely controlled by the lust of his flesh. I mean, we're told here he goes to the festival like his wife dies. She's been dead like, you know, he, he grieves for like five minutes. And then, and then he decides to go to the sheep shearers festival, which just so you know, man, um, in antiquity, like back in the day of, of, of Judah, you got to understand the sheep shearers festival, it was basically like an ancient Mardi Gras, man. I mean, you, you went, you got crunk, you got crazy, right? Everybody's drinking, everybody's getting together and hooking up. I mean, it's like what happens at the sheep shearers festival stays at the sheep shearers festival. Kind of, seriously, kind of one of those things. I mean, it's crazy town. 
It was crazy the things that would go down here. And so we're told that, that, that Judah goes to this festival and then notice what happens. He gets there and we're told in the text that he makes a beeline for a lady that he believes is a prostitute. Then he propositions her. And here's what's so interesting about this story, man. What we're finding out here through him propositioning this lady is it doesn't sound like it's the first time he's done this. Like he doesn't sound real naive when he's approaching this lady. Secondly, watch this. Secondly, notice, it's crazy, man. Notice that when Tamar, who was disguised herself as a prostitute, asks Judah for some collateral, Right? She, she asked him for some collateral as a form of payment. Notice that we're told that Judah, um, as a form of collateral, to give her something until he could give her the payment, Judah gives her his signet and his, and his, uh, his cord. And this is so interesting, man, because that didn't mean a whole lot to us in like, you know, 2015 going up. But you got to get this, man. This is crazy because Bible scholars tell us that this would have basically been the equivalent of giving a prostitute your driver's license and social security card. This was literally Brother Man's identification. So he's handing over his ID to a prostitute. Now, the point, the basic bottom line point that's being driven home to every single one of us and and men to all of us is this. When you are controlled by lust, it will always cause you to do really, really stupid things. Now, there's something else I I want to say here in this. It's, It's this, because I... I don't know about you, man. I've, I've heard this story a handful of times, you know, throughout my life. And it seems like every time I hear it, you know, poor Tamar gets kind of thrown under the bus, figuratively speaking, right? And she's like, and I don't think that's fair. Let me tell you why, man. I, here's the deal. Obviously, Tamar's committing a terrible sin. There's no doubt about it. It's, it's horrible. You know, just dressing up like a prostitute, tricking Judah into sleeping with her, getting her pregnant. I mean, it's, awful. it's about as awful as it gets, right? But, that being said, please don't miss it. Please pay attention to why she commits this horrible sin. Watch this, man. Don't miss why Tamar is committing this crazy sin, Emmaus, because this is actually a really big deal. Because here's what you have to remember. Here's the point you have to remember in all this, man. For her entire life, the men around her have completely failed her. Her whole life. I mean, think about it, man. Her first husband was so wicked, God killed him. Her, her second husband was a selfish knucklehead who, quite frankly, used her for sex and then for, refused to fulfill his responsibility to her. And now you got Judah who lies to her, deceives her, refuses to do what he's supposed to do, and has no intent on doing it. So, so think about this, man. Follow this. Think, think about this. For Tamar's entire life, she has been totally failed by men. Well, watch this, man. For her entire life, men haven't loved her, men haven't cared for her, men haven't served her, men haven't protected her, men haven't provided for her, men haven't set godly examples for her, and tragically, men have not led her spiritually. And watch this, man. As a result of men choosing to ignore their responsibility and choosing to be passive and selfish and ungodly, Tamar is now sinning. And, the, and listen, the, the basic point is this, church family. The basic point is this. It seems like, and men, let me say this. Men, it seems like a whole lot of pain could be avoided if men would just step up to be the spiritual leaders God has called us to be. I mean, this is basically the Garden of Eden all over again, man. That's what this is. I'm reading this, and this is Genesis chapter 3 all over again. What what do we got? We we got men refusing to be men. We got men refusing to lead by example. We got men refusing to care for their wives. We got men refusing to point their wives to the Lord. And as a result of that vacuum of spiritual leadership, what do we have? We got the wife who decides, well, I got to take control. I got to step in. I got to make some decisions because somebody's got to lead here. Men of Emmaus, listen to me. I'm I wrote it down. I'm going to read it like I, like I wrote it, okay? I want to say this. Men, a ton of pain can be avoided if we will just step up to humbly lead, serve, and love our wives the way that God has commanded us to. I'm not saying that easy. that's easy. Matter of fact, 
I think it's really, really hard, and it's only by the grace of God that we do it, but I'm telling you, a ton of pain is avoided if we humble ourselves before the Lord, lead like Jesus, serve our wives like Jesus, and love our wives like Jesus. I'll even go as far as to say this. When we refuse to be the spiritual leaders in our homes, we are actively, not passively, we are actively causing harm to our families. Now, again, don't, don't go get me wrong and misquote me. Don't mishear me. Tamar is absolutely responsible for her sin, for sure. She, she's responsible for it. But let's be honest, man. Let's just be real. She would not be in this position right here if the men in her life would have simply been doing what they were supposed to be doing. And that's truth. Now, verse 20. When Judah sent the young goat by his friend, the Adulamite, to take back the pledge from the woman's hand. He did not find her. And he asked the men of the place, where is the cult prostitute who is at an aim at the roadside? And they said, no cult prostitute has been here. Uh Uh-oh. So he returned to Judah and said, I've not found her. Also, the men of the place said, no cult prostitute has been there. And Judah replied, <laughs> Judah replied, uh, uh, you got to think of me saying that, uh, uh, let, let, her, let her keep the things as her own or, or we shall be laughed at. You see, I sent this young goat and you did not find her. You, you see what's happened there? He's getting nervous. He's getting nervous. He's thinking, what, what are you talking about? She's got my license. She's got my identity. She knows who I am. And then he goes, I, I got an idea, I got an idea. Well, just forget about it, forget about it. We'll pretend like it didn't happen. Pretend like, let's go, let's move on. Pretend like it didn't happen. Maybe it'll go away, right? That's the idea. Maybe it'll go away. Spoiler alert, it won't go away. It won't go away. It won't go away. Can, can I just be honest with you, church family? Can I just tell you, and some of you have heard this a thousand times, some of us have heard this 5,000 times, but it's absolutely true no matter how many times we hear it. Your sin will find you out. It might take two weeks, it might take three months, it might take 30 years, it might be at the judgment seat of Christ, but it'll be dragged into the light eventually. Verse 24. About three months later, Judah was told, Tamar, your daughter-in-law, has been immoral. Moreover, she is pregnant by immorality. And Judah said, bring her out and let her be burned. Really? Follow this, though. That's how we like to respond to everybody else's sin, isn't it? Somebody else has got sin. Justice, judgment, damnation. We sin. Forgive me. Right? There's a whole other sermon in there, but I'll spare you. Here's what I want you to do. (laughs) I want you to imagine that you're Tamar at this moment. Imagine this. Imagine you're Tamar and, and like you find out that Judah has given the order for you to be burned alive because you're pregnant. And, and what he doesn't know is he's the daddy. Imagine that, man. And, and so you hear all this, which by the way, that was extreme punishment. Like in their day, the punishment for adultery was to be stoned to death. This is excessive and crazy and brutal. It's like bring her out and burn her alive. And let's imagine you find that out. He's given the order and he's the daddy. I wonder this, how would you respond at that moment? How would you respond? Because I know how I'd respond, man. If I'm Tamar at this moment, I know how I'd respond. I would find a rooftop. I would get up on the rooftop and I would tell everybody within earshot who the baby's daddy was. I would spell his name. I would show the ID to everybody, throw in my shoes, right? I'm talking making a scene. You know what I mean? I mean, come on, man. Going Jerry Springer, pulling hair, whatever you got to do. This is crazy. But that's what... Honestly, that's, that's why this is so beautiful, man, because watch how much class Tamar has. Watch how much class she has. I mean, she really does. I don't know how she did it, but watch what she does. This is, this is amazing. Watch verse 25. Look at the class of this lady. Verse 25. As she was being brought out, just imagine that for a second. They come in and say, hey, Judah said we need to burn you alive. Come on. She's like, okay. <laughs> All right. Oh, wait, let me grab this ID. A social security card, right? As she, was bring, watch this, as she was being brought out, check this out. 
she sent word to her father-in-law by the man to whom these belong, I'm pregnant. And she said, please identify whose these are, the signet and the cord and the staff. Then Judah identified them. I bet he did. I bet. And Judah identified them and said, watch this, and said, she is more righteous than I since I did not give her to my son, Sheila, and he did not know her again. Now, but please don't miss this, church, because notice what happens. Follow this. Notice what happens at the exact moment that Judah is confronted with his sin. Notice what happened at that moment, because according to the text right here, at the very moment when he realizes that he is the man who got Tamar pregnant, what does he do? He says this. He says, she is more righteous than I am because I didn't give her my son. Do you see that? This lady's more righteous than me because I did not give her my son. In other words, in other words, what that means is this. He didn't make a bunch of excuses. He comes face to face with his sin. He, he, didn't, he didn't shift blame to somebody else, right? He, he didn't play some kind of shell game. He, he didn't rationalize his sin. He, he didn't pretend as if it's not a big deal. You know what? He, he doesn't look at Tamar and say, well, yeah, but like if you weren't dressed like a prostitute, none of it would have happened, right? He didn't do that. Did you see what he did? Watch this, church family. What does he do? What does he do? She is more righteous than I, since I did not give her to my son. In other words, what does he do? He owns his sin. Listen to me. He owns it. I'm not going to play some games. It's on me. It's on me. It's my fault. I did it. I will accept the consequences. I've sinned. He owns it. And then, and then watch this. Not only does he own it, but did you catch what else it said? I don't know if you noticed that little tag along at the end of verse 26, but, but notice it real quick. Look at what it said there at the very end of verse 26. It said this, and he did not know her again. Never touched her again. In other words, not only did Judah confess his sin, he stopped doing it. And just so you know, that is what we call biblical repentance. See, here's my fear. My fear is that some of us in here we're pretty good at confessing sin, but we really stink at running away from it. We're pretty good about saying, yeah, I messed up, I messed up, I did wrong, I messed up, I messed up, but we're, but, but we, but we're really not real good at, at running away from it, at, at confessing it to everybody else, and, and at saying, look, I gotta get away, so I need you to be in my life, and you to speak in my life, and I need to set up barriers and boundaries around me, and I wanna war against this thing. Some of us, we're really good at confessing it, we're not real good at running away from it, but beloved, hear me, just to circle back to where we were at the beginning of this sermon, I'm just gonna tell you, some things are worth running away from. Sin is a big deal. It's a big deal. And if you don't believe that it's a big deal, look at the cross of Christ because sin is what Jesus died for. And there's a responsibility, the God-given responsibility of the Christian, the worshiper of Jesus and follower of Jesus, not simply to confess sin when we mess up, but to war against it by the power of the Holy Spirit. To run away, that is biblical repentance. So here's the question. What sin is God calling you to own today? Listen, church family, listen. What sin is God calling you to own today? It's mine, I did it, it's on me. And what sin is God calling you to leave today? And he did not touch her again. What sin is God calling you to own and what sin is God calling you to leave? And then it ends with this, listen to this. Verse 27. When the time of her labor came, there were twins in her womb. And when she was in labor, 
One put out a hand and the midwife took and tied a scarlet thread on his hand saying, this one came out first. But as he drew back his hand, behold, his brother came out. And she said, what a breach you have made for yourself. Therefore, his name was called Perez. Afterward, his brother came out with the scarlet thread on his hand and his name was called Zera. So here's what we have, a scandalous event, a shady event, an awful event, and as the result, we have two twin boys who are born to Tamar. And then, here's what's so interesting. I want to close with this because I think it's really important. In Matthew chapter 1, we read about the genealogy of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And in the very, literally the first three verses of, of, of the book, the Gospel of Matthew, we read this. Listen to this. Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac, the father of Jacob, and Jacob, the father of Judah, and his brothers, and Judah, the father of Perez, and Zerah by Tamar. Do you see that? Let me, let me explain. Let me explain what you just got told. Listen to your family. Here's what you literally got told. We literally got told this. This lady, Tamar, who got pregnant in the most scandalous and shady circumstances imaginable is the great, 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 great grandmother of Jesus. And that's good news. And I'm gonna tell you something. That should put a smile on every single one of our faces. Because you know what that means? I don't know if you know what that means or not, but here's essentially what that means. The fact that Tamar and Judah and these, this kid right here, these twins are listed in the genealogy of Jesus. Here's what that means, man, for us. No matter what your sin may be, God is bigger and God is greater. And guess what? You still have a place at his table. Behold the gospel in Genesis 38. The point is this. If Tamar and Judah have a place at God's table, so do you, sinner. And if I had a mirror right now, I'd say, so do you, sinner. It's the good news of the gospel. So don't let your sin lead you into a shame that somehow leads you away from the Lord. Allow your sin to lead you to repentance that which in turn leads you into the embrace of the great God and Savior who paid the penalty for your sin on a cross so that you might have a seat at his table. Let's pray. And two questions as we pray. And before we respond to the Lord's Supper and celebrate some baptisms in a moment, which are really exciting. People following in obedience to Jesus. Each week we have these elements laid out on these tables at the side of the room and we have a moment where we respond in worship to the Lord, remembering the sacrifice that King Jesus paid for us on that cross because without the cross, none of us have access to God. Without the cross, we are lost in our sins. Without the cross, we are doomed to face the wrath of God. But Jesus Christ died on that cross in our place for our sin. And if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is the Lord, and if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That is the good news of the gospel. So what about my sin? What about what I've done? Who I've been with? What I've said? What I've thought? The places I've been? Listen to me. The cross of Christ is sufficient. When Jesus died on that cross, he died on that cross to cleanse you from your sin, all sin. And if you will bow the knee to King Jesus, you will be saved. And some of you, maybe you're here today and for the first time in your life, you need to say, Jesus, I need you to come into my life. I trust you. Would you save me? And if today you're ready to trust in Jesus as your savior, you're ready to do that, and here's what we would beg you to do. 
I take that connect card in your bulletin, fill it out, check off the box that says you're surrendering to Jesus so that we can come alongside you, love you, pray for you, follow up with you, and drop that in the basket as it passes by. For those of you who want to follow in obedience to Jesus today, we encourage you to do that. For others of us, we love Jesus. We trusted in Jesus. We've, we've, been, we've been following Christ for a long time, but you know what? Sin has, has owned you recently. And you need to know that you have a place at God's table through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. So repent. Do you trust and do you believe that no matter what your sin is, God is bigger, God is greater, and you have a place at his table because of the gospel? Father, right now, we worship you. I pray that if there's anybody in this room right now who needs to respond and go to the back for prayer from the ministry team, that you would move them to obedience that they wouldn't leave this place today without being prayed for. And maybe for some of us to run away from sin, to leave sin, it looks like going to someone back there and saying, would you pray for me? Well, whatever it looks like today, I pray for us as a body. I pray for us as followers of Jesus, Lord. Lord, that we would be Broken people, messy people who acknowledge openly our brokenness and our messiness knowing that the gospel of the cross is sufficient. Would we not pretend? Would we not put on a face? Would we be a gospel people who really aren't that afraid to say, you know what, I'm broken and I stumble every single day, but praise God for the gospel. And Lord, would we also be a people who by the power of your Holy Spirit that lives within us to give us victory over sin, would we make war over sin, running from it, give us wisdom to know what that looks like? Would we behold the gospel in one of the messiest, most awkward stories in all of the Bible? Would we behold the beauty of the cross? Thank you that because of Jesus, we have a place at your table. I pray it all through Christ.